Welcome to Estate Talks. I'm George Compton, the publisher of Executorium. Today we're talking about books. We hope to provide answers and give you some basics so you ask better questions. Today our guest is Steve, the bookman Eisenstein. Steve has been in the book business since 1968. He's the voice of Books on the Bookshelf, a weekly broadcast net radio show about books, Saturdays, 10 to 12 on WDBFradio.com. He's the admin of the mighty Facebook group, Vintage Rare and Antique Books, a great community of book experts and collectors and, and, and hobbyists. Steve is an appraisal expert and owner of Bric-a-Brac Bookshop in Miami Beach, Florida. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thank you very much, George. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And in the time we have, I hope that we can impart some knowledge to those of you who are watching this live or in the future. Um, books are an overwhelming thing to a lot of people in the States, especially when they have a lot of them. You walk into the main room of the house and there's a 2000 book library that's been in the family for generations and some of those books even have a story attached to them that's been passed down in the family sidebar note most of those stories are not accurate okay and i use an example of something and i apologize for the nature of the example but it's highly illustrative I've been doing this since 1968. That's 54 years. So from 68 into the early 90s, we would have people that would come into just our store or wherever we were at the time and say, hey, my uncle was so-and-so. And during World War II, he was in Germany and he was in the bunker and he got this. Okay, this could have been a book. This could have been a knife, a sword, uh, whatever it is. If you added up all those stories about things that family relatives in World War II found in the so-called bunker, the bunker would be about 15 airplane hangers in size. So don't shoot the messenger if they tell you and show you factually, well, you know, I'm sorry, your family story is not accurate and here's why. Um, just a cautionary note, that happens a lot. So when you're looking at this library and you're overwhelmed, back away from it for a minute. If you got a pencil and paper or you can keep playing this on rewind, copy this down. I'll refer to it later. There are places that you can go to get pricing comparisons. They are dealer asking prices, but they're not always accurate. Throw, you know, when you look at something and you see 50 copies of a book, the same title as yours, and a bunch of them are in similar condition, you might see a price of a, high, a super high price, a bunch of super low prices. In the middle is what the fair market average would generally be. And when you're looking at these sites, Via Libri is one, V I A. L V I A L I B R I dot net via Libri dot net or an easier one to remember add all A D D A L L dot com. We don't know if the book sold at that price, if they sold at that price. And if you're looking for the people, they'll give you the name of the dealer that was selling the book. Look for credentialed letters after that dealer's name. It could be something like I might have FABA, Florida Antiquarian Book Dealers Association, um, Liabda, Long Island Antiquarian Book Dealers Association, Rocky Mountain Booksellers. All across the country, there are regional and state groupings of book dealers. What does that mean? It means that those people pass the vetting process of their peers and you know you don't have as much to worry about as if you're dealing with a stranger all right so you know uh the family library is made up of everything from fiction to non-fiction so let's go with the most important thing that i can impart in a simple sentence age has nothing to do with the value of a book I'm going to whet your appetite to look for this book. Find the first edition of The Great Gatsby. It's going to be a book with green cloth, gilt titles, and hopefully a paper dust jacket. 
when it comes to fiction, this paper dust jacket, if you had a fine book and a fine dust jacket on The Great Gatsby, $200,000 would be a realistic price for that book. Don't expect to find it. It's kind of hard to find, but maybe you will. Okay, so the book with the jacket is $200,000 take the dust jacket off the book you can get 150 or more for the dust jacket but it, the retail value on the book without the dust jacket dependent on how fine the guilt is that's still on the titles and all of that anywhere from seven to twelve thousand dollars or asking prices these days so in fiction it has to be a collectible author. Do not get the disease first editionitis, which is my own word. And that's the that's the thing. Oh, my God, I found the first edition. Just because it says first edition doesn't mean anything. And just because the book is signed doesn't mean it's worth money. If the author is an author like Anne Rice or Stephen King or anybody that's a household word author, Hemingway, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, Steinbeck, it, I could go on for hours on that those would be collectible signatures but a lot of times in what their signature it could be worth more to you on a ten dollar check made out to you than in your book how do you identify uh the difference between the signed copy of the first edition uh, edition of a nobody that may be not worth anything versus that you know something that may have some value, not maybe the treasure, the extremely rare, but something that has value that you can sell. How do you ID books? Well, let's use, a, let's use add all. Okay. Identification of first edition is exceptionally complicated. I'll give you a quick example where I was talking about the book, The Great Gatsby. Okay. If you have the, if you have a copy of The Great Gatsby, what you have to do is i'm showing you this let me look at the very bottom where you see the great gatsby the description of what you have to look for in that book continues on to the next page there's certain errors that were made in the book so the errors identify the first edition and the corrections identify the second edition the first edition, with all the points, is the big money. When you go to a site like adall.com, they've done a lot of the homework for you. Hopefully, you're reading it from somebody that knew what they were doing. So they would list The Great Gatsby and what it takes to make a first edition or another book. Not every Those are referred to as points. Points identify one edition from another, but not every book has points, um, you know. Some books have one or two points. If you get into something like Dickens, you could need a, you'd need a bibliography to check the points. But let me try and bring something in. We talked about fiction for a moment. Yeah, I could talk about that for hours. Nonfiction to the untrained eye is kind of where the bread and butter is easy to discern. Look in your library and look for leather-bound books, Okay. This is Samuel Tyler Coleridge's The Table Talks, okay? It's a two-volume set, okay? It's the first edition from 1840. Um, the retail on this two-volume set is about $375. But there's something really important that you need to see. S who bound the book is just real could be really important there are picassos of bookbinders and then there's regular you know just craftsmen in this little fold older leather in the front or back of the book you want to look to see if anybody stamped their name in it see a name like uh sutcliffe and sangorsky see a name like revere bain tune goes on and on those are the better bookbinders and who bound the book makes a difference um you also want to look, if there's nothing in that particular little leather strip, look in the first couple of blank pages on the tops, front or back, or verso of the pages, as the back is called. See if there's a little rubber stamp that says bound by. Who bound the book is important. If you look carefully, the information might be there. There's another little trick, and in this one, everybody's got, I think you're really going to enjoy this. 
answer the question to yourself because I can't hear you. <laughs> Did you ever hear of a four edge painting? No. Okay. What is a four edge painting? Is a book dealer when I get a book that has a gilt edge or all edges are gilt, I am required by law, so to speak, <laughs> to make sure that this book is not hiding a four edge painting. Okay. Now, this is the first time in years that I've done this because the last time I showed a four-edge painting, I broke the binding. Okay, I'm not going to do that today. But let me get it going in the right direction. What you want to do is extremely carefully bend the book like this, and you see the painting on the edge? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's called a four-edge painting. Sometimes the four-edge painting wraps around the book. Look at your leather-bound books. That's really important if you find them. And in general, you're looking for books. When you're looking for books like art, architecture, photography, what you're looking for is art books that have lithographs or where the artist you know, did something on the end papers of the book. Architecture, household word architects, Frank Lloyd Wright, Jenner Red, all those others. Photography, you're looking for books that are monographs, okay? A monograph is a book on a singular theme. So you don't want the photographers of the world you want a book that's just about Edward Weston, Henry Cartier-Bresson, Paul Weston, Strand, Steichen. There's so many names to learn in photography. But especially from the 30s to the 60s or so, if you find individual monographs by photographers, you could find some very good books. Um, hunting, fishing, firearms, archery, very collectible subjects. The more specific, the better, just like in the art, architecture, and photography. You want big game books in exotic places. You want Zane Gray fishing books, big game fishing in exotic places. Those are the themes. Um, this is this is extremely I, helpful. The uh, to the to the average executor, this is uh, just going to help look at the bookshelves in a different way and the volumes in a different way and what they're looking for. Of course, it's a good time to remind uh, people watching that you know there is the Facebook group Vintage Rare and Antique Books uh, where uh, Steve is an administrator. Uh, and George, man. May Very I interrupt helpful. you for a second? Yes, of if course. You, if you join the group, there's going to be a question, why are you joining? Just put in the word executorium, okay? okay. That way, you know, tell us why. <laughs> you know, there's other questions to answer. Uh, there's only six rules in the group, and number five is have to have fun. Um, we teach you everything there from A to Z. There's, there's 44,700 people in the group, and we just added 300 members from Friday to Wednesday. Yeah. There's people so who want to help you out there. There's people who are looking to buy your books, uh, appraise your books, whatever you might need in a book need. You can get questions answered there. I'm a member of that group and it's just, and, and I'm not a bookie by any, uh, <clears throat> by any, uh, stretch of the imagination. I've read a few myself, but, uh, as far as understanding this world of books, that's just a great open access resource. Um, books on the bookshelf too. Steve's own show is a great, uh, resource to listen and learn about the world of books. You can call in directly with questions. Again, it's uh, net radio, wdbf.com uh, on Saturdays. Uh, the Antiquarian uh, uh, Booksellers uh, of America uh, is a resource and a not-for-profit uh, association uh, with, uh, you know, a code of ethics for selling and buying uh, books. So if you walk into your local bookshop, you could probably look for the, uh, you know, their designation. If they're members, uh, they would be bound by a code of ethics. That's always a good thing when you plop a book of box of books on the on the counter to to see uh, uh antiquarian booksellers association uh uh designation there's also the floor what was it steve the florida Faba. Um, well it's Faba. let me let me the abaa is the antiquarian antiquarian book dealers of america um those are all antiquarian book dealers then there's the state organizations being in a being 
a member of a group is not a prerequisite, but to the untrained eye, it lets you know that that person's been vetted. Just because someone's not vetted is not a reason not to use them. But if yeah. you're quoting their prices, you want to know that they have, you know, some kind of, you know, knowledgeable experience in the field. Um, you know, as I say many times, and that's how my show Bucks on the Bookshelf opens, is more people know the value of coin stamps and objects of art that they don't own versus the people who know the value of the book on their home library shelves. Um, right. So let's take it right in that moment where you've got uh, some pieces that you've pulled out of the estate library. Uh, and you think they've got value, or maybe you've taken pictures of all the bindings and you brought them to somebody knowledgeable. Uh, if you're appraised, getting them appraised, you uh, you know will have a uh, fair mar market price that uh, report that you've paid for. Uh, an appraiser should not be should be should not be buying your books. But if you're walking into a, a book dealer, a book reseller uh, with a with a box of books. You know, you will get their uh, buyer's uh, estimate of the value of the books, and that banter is between you and the buyer. Um, so, how do we know what the price is, Steve? So okay. We, you know, well, so we do well, uh, our best at the uh, at the counter. There's another site, and I would highly recommend this if you walk in and there's anywhere from a shelf to a room full of what would be antiquarian books. You know, you're walking into a house full of books this size and 10 times larger that are leather bound with maps, charts, color plates, and all that. It's called rarebookhub.com. As an appraiser, yes, I use Ad all and those other sites, but as an appraiser, I want auction prices. I want to know the price that the money exchange hands for and under the condition which that auction occurred because that affects the price. So if you know here's the bread and butter. Let's say for argument's sake, you came up to me with a book that's worth a hundred dollars. What would I is a fair market value pay for that book? That book I might pay anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars for tops, unless and, and even less, unless it's something super hot. You know, it's a good solid hundred dollar book. Just because a book is there's an old saying. Remember this one of all: rarer than a rare book is sometimes the buyer for it. Okay. So if it's a hundred dollar book, it's going to vary. Let's talk about something expensive. Let's say you got really lucky and you found some kind of ten thousand dollar book. First of all, if I had that book and I was selling it to a dealer at ten thousand dollars, I've got to, to automatically give them a twenty percent reciprocal dealer discount. So that ten thousand dollar book is now eight thousand dollars. I've got to think that when I'm buying the book, that it might, you know, when I price the book, it might be sold to a dealer. If someone comes up and offers you anywhere from 40, 30, 40, 50 percent of what the book is worth at that rate, maybe up to 60, depending on what it is, TTMAR, take the money and run. Rarer than the book is sometimes the buyer for it. That's, so, uh, that's very know. powerful. My mother was right, Steve. She used to say, when I would say, well, this is worth X. She would say, well, now all you have to do is find the buyer to pay yeah. X. Yeah. So she was a wise woman. Uh, you know, eBay or, you know, and 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 some of these other sites are, are asking prices. So you hit the nail on the head. What is the price when the money changed hands? And the other thing that you're 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 that is important to say to somebody that is plopping a pot, box of books on the counter that and and think they're worth you know you know hundreds of thousands of dollars or even hundreds of dollars is that you know these businesses these bookshops these dealers <clears throat> you have a have a knowledge of the people who are the are the buyers they're the collectors and they've put up years and 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 their knowledge available uh and keeping the lights on and advertising their businesses and all that overhead uh into being available to buy and then from there sell to the people like you say uh, rarer than the book is the buyer so they can find those buyers and they're out there and available for those buyers so mm -hmm. to you to those executors with books don't discount that that's a that's a valuable mm -hmm. valuable piece of this uh, dynamic 
you are your client list in this business. You know, there is some deal. I'll give you an example of something. It's one of my favorite recent stories of the last few years. And the title of this story might be, What's the Book Worth? <clears throat> and I'm using my favorite example, The Great Gatsby. There's a modern library edition, which is a book that's a little bigger than this. It's done in the 40s. You know, it's reprints of all kinds of um, famous novels. They did a reprint of The Great Gatsby. F. Scott Fitzgerald hated the introduction that was used in that modern library book. So a guest that was on the show, this dealer, is in somewhere in the New England area a few years ago. And he walks into a bookstore where they just acquired the first, the modern library edition of this book signed by F. Scott Fitzgerald on that introduction page with the words, I hate this introduction. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow. You know, and not only is it unique, one of a kind inscription, but it's really poignant. Okay. How'd so, Zelda feel about it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if she was alive when when that one. I don't remember when she died, but yeah. How does he feel about his book going for two hundred? My fantasy is to find somebody's grandfather that worked in the dust jacket department of Scribner's and put a few away flat in a box. But to go on with the um, modern library story, modern library book signed by Fitzgerald in this store, $5,000, no discount. We just got it. He buys it. About three weeks later, he sells it to two very notable book dealers in the Philadelphia area for $18,500. That's the end of it for now. A year later, the person that originally bought this book was touring around the New York Antiquarian Book Fair, which is like the Rolls-Royce, Cartier, and Tiffany of book fairs. And I've he been there. Sees, it was great. And he sees his book. There's not another one of these. In a very, very upscale London book dealer's booth, $62,500. Okay? Okay. This man had the client list. The average person doesn't. So don't always expect to get the top dollars. Well, just because you saw it sell in somebody's store doesn't mean, you know, you go or asking price. You know, you don't know if you were going to get it. There's a million things that you really need to know when you're selling books. If you do find quality books, Go for an evaluation or an appraisal. And let me define something. If you come to me and say, Steve, I need an appraisal for, you know, you're, I'm going to be creating a legal document for you based on the purposes that we are creating this legal document for you that you told us you want. Um, then I have to sign something that says I have no interest past, present, perspective. My valuation, you know, my uh, fee is not contingent on the valuation, etc. So I can't do anything with you other than hand you the appraisal. But if you go into a bookstore and they say, well, we can do an evaluation for you, they're not creating a legal document. They're kind of like saying, you work with me, I'll work with you. I'll help you value them and sell them. You know, I want a percentage or this is what it's worth, you know, um, in that sense. So, you know, uh, you can go in and talk to a book dealer. Just be cautious about how you use the word appraisal because then you put them in a, you know, a constricted um, environment and all they can do is appraise for you. I think that's a very important distinction and important for a novice or a person without any experience in this environment to know. And when you get an appraisal, you've got a, like you said, a, uh, a an obligation from the appraiser to put a fair market price to it and not make an offer on it. And if you experience anything other than that, then uh, <clears throat> you probably need to put some distance uh, between yes. you and that, and that person. So, yes. uh, but when you go in and you get an evaluation, uh, that's a different, that's a different story. It's uh well, it's a little more flexible and executors may not have time to go and find uh, you know, the perfect uh, uh, purchase 
scenario for any given item among the personal property, among the estate, they've got a pile of things to attend to. So this certainly helps get that uh, understanding and many understandings in tow for the for the executor looking at a whatever number of linear feet of of books uh, they're they're dealing with. <clears throat> Steve, I do have to wrap up things, but I I want to tell everyone that Steve and I have been talking about you know doing a little deeper dive into books and collectibles and ephemera. Uh, and there's there's just it's a fascinating world. It was not something I got into prior to being an executor, prior to being the publisher of Executorium. So um, there is an article on Executorium, what to do with old books. And it mentions some of the uh, uh, resale uh, database uh, websites that Steve mentioned. Uh, what to do with old books, vintage and antique books, paperbacks too. what to do is on Executorium.com. Um Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America and their code of ethics is worth knowing about. Um, we talked about treasures, conditions, the jacket. Um, let me let me just show. Let me let me whet everybody's appetite to research. Never take anything for granted. This looks like a little paperback, you know, published in the 20s. You're looking at a $600 little piece of published in the 20s, okay? Never judge a book by its cover. If you look at this, you would say, wow, what could this be? What it is is actually a very collectible art magazine. If you had to run the 20 issues of this, you're looking at about $40,000, um, and what in this one, it just happens to highlight um, some very notable artists of the period and some limited edition pieces within it. Um, you know, you never judge a book by its cover. It's 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 amazing. And and, and following my visit to the uh, New York Book Fair uh, from uh, uh, American Booksellers and Dealers Association, uh, and he had a chance to talk to some of those folks about ephemera. It's one of the easiest things to throw out and happens all the time. So to wrap things up, know what you've got. Uh, talk to people, uh, the Facebook group, the books on the bookshelf, uh, Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. Know about the little independent bookshops all across the United States. You might find a resource locally uh, that can help you. Uh, with an evaluation, um, appraisers all across the United States can help you, uh, you know, find a uh, market value for your books and assign it uh, legally. Um, so <clears throat> before Zoom cuts us off, I want to offer our thanks to Steve Eisenstein. Thank you, George. For being our guest and uh, uh, look forward to more in a deeper dive that we can go in many different areas of this uh book collection uh and ephemera and i uh, want to thank uh everyone for listening so thank you very much thank you and if roy rogers and dale evans were book dealers we'd be singing happy book sales and buys to you till we meet again ciao for <laughs> now thank you george it's been a pleasure thank you all thank you steve